You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Schumann Show. Uh, Glad you could join us. There's a lot happening around the world. Um, Matt, I feel like, you know, over the last two years we've been dealing with uh, the, the, the addiction (laughs) <laughs> of the industry where they got high off their own supply chains where they brought in so much product they're not trying to get rid of it uh anytime i can work yep. in uh, an east coast rap reference i will do so which automatically makes this podcast a classic anyway um <laughs> the the whiplash continues uh yep. if, it's, if it's not trying to bring in a ton of product to meet consumer demand we got guys uh in yemen attacking ships um, we have new port negotiations taking place on East Coast ports down to the Gulf that's coming up in the in the uh, the late summer. Um, you know, capacity issues are, are back to the forefront where we saw for a while there wasn't a big issue, then there was a big issue, and then there wasn't another is again. So we need we need to figure out what the hell's going on here. Yeah, man, we definitely need to figure that out because, uh, as you said, things are chaotic. And there's no one better to come in and talk to us about what's happening, particularly as it relates to freight, the movement of goods all over the world, than one Mr. Mike Pisa, who is Senior Vice President, Corporate, Corporate Business Development at Apex Logistics International. He's a longtime friend of ours personally. He's a longtime friend of the industries and FDRA. Mr. Pisa, welcome to Shoe and Show, my friend. Hey, Matt, thanks, Matt and Andy. Thanks a lot for having me back. I appreciate it. I love being here. Yeah, no problem. So I wanted you on in particular because one of the things that I heard recently that surprised me, and I wasn't really, it wasn't on my radar to one of our members mentioned it, was the fact that you had the president not too long ago announced in the Rose Garden an increase in tariffs of upwards of 25% um, uh, and more on additional products coming from China that start on August 1st. Um, and in that moment, there was seemed to launch this run on capacity to get product in here to avoid the tariffs before August 1st. And so I was like, you know what? I told Andy, we got to get Pisa on shoe in because he can tell us what's happening on the capacity side and what just that one decision is doing as it relates to the availability of space. And so let's start there and then we'll unwind and we'll go through Andy's tick list of terribleness uh, that, that we're all facing. And I'll start there. Yeah. Andy, you left a few off there, man. You forgot bridge collapse. You know, you've got some things in there. man. <laughs> well, I, I, listen, I, I want to tease people a little bit. They got to listen all the way to the end, right? So we'll get, we'll get there. Spoiler alert. That sucks. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. Yes. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. But yeah, Matt, you're right about the three hundred one tariffs. You know, uh, you know, some people seem to have an indication that this was coming. So, uh, you know, early in the year, we engaged in conversations with all these different customers, and they they wanted to start doubling their volume coming into the country, um, just to you know, sensing that this uh, increase was going to happen, and uh, it, it was. It's not surprising, I guess, to a lot of people. And then this is an election year too, so. Um, you know, that's also, you know, there, there's a lot of folks bringing in stuff early, you know, in, you know, kind of in, in, antes- in anticipation of like tariff increase increases next year, no matter what happens politically, you know, it, it seems like it's going to keep going up. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the thought process behind it is that they want more time to diversify their sourcing. So like in, in I can reference a few different customers, some of them in, in uh, the footwear industry and other industries. Obviously, they've been sourcing in China heavily, and they want some time to move to Vietnam and some other places. So they, they've doubled their imports into the U.S. out of China right now in hopes of that'll give them enough inventory to transfer their sourcing to other countries, let's say. And it, it's really straining capacity quite a bit. And, and the issue that you're talking about, you know, there, there's a couple of things at play here. Um, you know, and I've been doing this a while, and... and uh, you know, I've only seen it a couple of times, you know, from the NVO side, we negotiate our contracts in April of every year. That's kind of our ocean contracts get negotiated in April of every year. And then by like May 10th of this year, you know, the carriers were coming back to us with GRIs and PSSs and all this different stuff. Um, so the contract really doesn't mean anything. And, um, 
the, it's it's uh, it's a strange time. It really bothers me when that happens because you spend all this time negotiating a contract, and then the following month it really doesn't have much value. And and the, the carriers are honoring some of the the rates, right? The fixed rate, the the contract rates, which, which were very low this year. They were like in the let's say fifteen to two thousands. And fifteen hundred to two thousand to the West Coast, and now all of a sudden you're seeing rates up in the, you know, seven to nine thousand dollar range, depending on uh, the, the FAK spot rates are in the seven to nine thousand dollar range, depending on the carrier. So it, there's a big gap between the spot rate and the fixed rate, and um, you know all all these things come into play. I mean, those three hundred one tariffs have really you know uh, you know you know driven people to import sooner than they wanted to. I think, and uh, it, you know, there's a big capacity crunch. I mean. You throw in all the other things that Andy mentioned with the you know, people firing at ships, uh, you know, all, all these different issues really have compounded you know, the problem, let's say. Yeah, I think sometimes we sometimes folks forget we're competing for space right. against every other industry across the globe. Right. Like, so remember that when you're looking at this and saying, why is it this way? It's like, well, you're competing against, you know, everybody else trying to bring in Christmas early. Um, right. And Andy, I'll just, add, just, let me just add on to that real quick. I know that there's a problem when the top, you know, top 20 importers in the country start calling me and asking me for space. That's when I know there's a problem. And all of, uh, all of them have called me. So. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, it, the, the thing, all right. So the Houthis in the Red Sea, right? Like if there's this thing where, People are going back and forth that there's a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, and that means that there's a reduction in Houthi attacks on ships because Iran will pull them back uh, over the ceasefire. Um, and then, therefore, like it can help relieve some of the rates. I actually don't think that's accurate. Um, I actually think that the attacks will reduce, but they won't quit. It's quite lucrative for these guys to go out and attack ships. Um it's lucrative, so why would they stop uh, as a as a livelihood? If you if you've never researched Yemen, it's not exactly you know paradise. So um, and they don't you know the per capita you know per day is terrible. So uh, also their uh, capital is running out of water. So uh, the, these guys have incentives to go out there beyond just like an ideological war. So it's one of the things that will con- continue to happen, I think. And um, we had a speaker come. Uh, to our board meeting um, not too long ago, and and he talked about the the asymmetrical capabilities have expanded for attacks because you can get a drone now and fly it anywhere. Um, so it's not like you need to invest in missiles or heavy you know military things to do these kind of attacks. So uh, you know, if you're looking for like pressure reliefs, I don't know. Um, you know, if, if Mike's sitting there talking about how twenty importers are talking about their capacity is getting constrained uh and then you still have you know ongoing attacks and um yeah i guess the other kind of matt the other kind of yeah. thing that we're looking at is taiwan um, yeah. growing tensions between china and taiwan and um and a lot more military action in that area where shipping goes through as well so yeah. I mean, that's what we've been trying to do is prepare our members to critically think. In fact, shameless plug time, a great segue. Uh, Mike Pisa is going to be appearing at the New York Stock Exchange with us July 16th at the SHU Executive Sourcing Summit, uh, along with Zach Cooper, who's, gonna, who's going to talk about the Taiwan-China conflict. And so you can go to shoesourcingevent.com, uh, no, shoesourcingsummit.com. Yep. Uh, to learn more about all of that. So, Mike, as you think about heading into that event, that's just you know not too long from now. Where are we going to be as it relates to some of these rates? Is there is there any is there a lull in sight where we're going to see kind of a you know the August first deadline on the tariffs that will hit, and then obviously moving into holiday that that has to come to an end at some point. Is there a lull on the on the horizon, or is this elevated seven or eight thousand per container? spot rate level is that kind of what we're going to see from the yeah i think you guys are bringing up a lot of good points here like the the china u.s trade tension issue is is a big issue so i mean that that continues to go on i mean it's now being you know i I watched a a, something on 60 minutes on sunday night that had the all all about that the u.s china uh trade tension uh but the the initial uh 
feedback that was from the ocean carriers they thought it was going to end in sometime july and august and now that that is not going to be the case um you know, you've seen articles out there from Maersk and some of the other carriers that have basically said listen our our vessels are all out of whack in terms of uh their rotations um and there's equipment issues uh, in terms of, you know, some of the carriers are really experiencing equipment issues at origin, uh, depending on the origin. Um, but, you know, the, the vessel, the vessel strands are out of whack, so they're not running in their typical cycles. And um, and so it's not when you talk about vessel movement, it's not something you can fix overnight. So our initial feedback that we got was it's going to be fixed by August. And now, you know, just as early as Monday, yesterday, uh, we we talked to two of the carriers and they said, listen, this is not going to end until the end of the year, possibly Chinese New Year. So we think it's more of a longer term issue at this point. Um, and, you know, every day that goes by, it kind of gets a little bit worse. Um, you know, if you have if you're on a contracted rate right now, you know, it, yes, you know, the carriers are honoring some of those contracted rates. But if you're on a low rate, um, you know, they're going to roll you a couple, it could be two, three, four weeks until that container moves. And that, that's a mm. big problem. You know, you know it, it feels yeah. a lot like COVID, to be honest with you. I mean, that's that's kind of the general sentiment. Oh, <laughs> bite your tongue. Bite your tongue, It man. feels a lot like COVID. It really does. Um, the carriers are taking the higher, highest price, uh, you know, uh, highest rate uh, that's going to move. And listen, some of the carriers brought back those diamond services and... Uh, you know, per, you know, guaranteed ship on the space, and those rates are even higher than what we're talking about. And people are paying them. People are paying them. So it's, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, let think. Let's put it into perspective. I don't know what first cost is for some of these like higher end products. Let's say an electric vehicle or solar panels or whatever it is. And you and you're adding a 25% duty on top of that. You're, you know, it's a bargain to pay the diamond rate on a carrier to get That's it in correct. here before before those yeah. tariffs hit and just get it here, right? And right. secure that space. So it makes sense. Um, what you know, one thing that we've talked about uh, to Pete Minto in the past uh, was just like ship capacity around like um, aging ships. So you mentioned, uh, obviously, the the Baltimore Harbor, which was um, a terrible tragedy. Um, but it's an aging ship that had some problems. Are we are are we dealing more with that? Where uh, we're also dealing with longer term capacity issues because ships are not on the seas as much because they're having to be repaired. Are no, Andy. That? Actually, I think it's a little bit the opposite. You know, there's a lot of new there's a lot of new capacity coming on in Q3 and Q4 this year. Uh, it's the larger vessels, okay. so I can't really speak about the aging ships because I'm not real well versed in that. But I, I yep. know that there's a lot of new capacity yep. coming on, and our hope was with all that new capacity coming on in Q3 and Q4, that would keep the rate levels low. That was like kind of our that's what our anticipation was. I but uh, I, you know, at this point, I'm not sure what's going to happen. So, how? Let me ask you this for um, a lot of folks. Uh, manufacturing in Vietnam, and now it's matriculating into Cambodia, Bangladesh, kind of a little bit all over. How are the supply chains uh, in Southeast Asia outside China maturing? Are yeah. they maturing rapid enough to where there's you, you guys feel comfortable and can execute quite? I, I mean, what level are they compared to China? Are they quite there yet or not? Yeah, that's a great question. But I would say that Vietnam is definitely there. Their supply chain is yeah, running okay. smooth. There's a lot of capacity there now. Um, you know, we you know, you know we tend to dominate Bangladesh. We're the largest ocean provider out of Bangladesh. I, I have a business partner. His name is Viknesh Halachandra, and uh, that's kind of his specialty. Uh, so we have a very strong presence there. But you know, the supply. It's a great question. Like you know, before I met Viknesh, right. Anytime I heard Bangladesh, I would kind of run the other direction <laughs> because it was very hard to deal with that. It was very hard to to operate within Bangladesh in terms of they have different kind of uh, guidelines as it relates to the supply chain, and you have to be prepared for those. But I would say they're definitely mature and rapidly, Andy. I mean, we're running very smooth out of those countries. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you know, you know, there's certain countries that are that are not up to speed that I would call like the Philippines. I would say Cambodia still got some work to do, and. There's there's pockets within Southeast Asia that are maturing faster than others, but I, it's definitely 
better than it was five years ago. In, in most cases. Is that your tagline now? Apex Logistics <laughs> big in Bangladesh? Is that the... Uh... <laughs> hey, I, you guys made a plug. I had to make a plug. <laughs> well, I, I, hey, I, kudos to you because I was bleary-eyed and on my way to a midnight flight out of Ho Chi Minh, and I looked up to my right before disembarking from my from my car and saw the big apex logo like lit up the night sky <laughs> in Saigon. And I was like, pizza, pizza's uh, here too. So, yeah. We got a big cousin. So we're running planes in and out of there. So it's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. What about the, what about the planes? Is are, what, are, what's the, the situation with cost, uh, planes capacity? I know like, you know, during COVID there were, yeah, I always credit you because you always, you know, one thing yeah. that always stuck in my mind was, something like 75% of uh, cargo is is on commercial planes. And when the commercial planes all like shut down, that really had an impact. So That's correct. Where yeah. are we at in terms of, of uh, air freight? Yeah, I did want to talk a little air freight today because it's been, it's been a really unique situation. Uh, um, you know, the air freight has always been dominated by the tech sector, right? So the tech sector, they had the margins in their product and they wanted – they couldn't have that much uh, car, you know, uh, cost of goods on the water, so they always kind of air freighted the goods, phones, tablets, you know, you kind of name it in terms of the tech sector. Um, and then there's been this emergence, which we, you, you, me, and Matt have been talking about it for years, is this cross-border e-commerce, okay? And I, I'll, I'll just say that, like, when I look, when I consider air freight, I, I've seen some, you know, large RFQs when it comes to air freight, and the volumes are staggering, right? It's, it's really, uh, really large volumes, and... But now these cross-border e-commerce guys uh, that have emerged over the last year or two, it's happened very quickly, are, are moving the same amount of volume by air freight as some of these large tech companies. And uh, uh, so the e-commerce business is really taking up, you know, the cross-border e-commerce business is really taking up a lot of the air capacity. And, uh, and that's keeping rates high, Andy. So like in certain markets, the rates are relatively high. Let's say China. Uh, Vietnam, obviously Hong Kong, you know, those markets have a lot of that cross-border e-commerce business coming in to not just the USA too. It's coming into you know the UK and all these other countries you know around the world. Um, so it's keeping that air freight rate relatively high. And uh, I know Matt, you we've talked about there's some bills out there trying to limit this cross-border e-commerce business or the, the yeah you know, yeah. So I, you know maybe you can you know just provide an update on that too. Yeah, I mean, I, I as you were talking about, it, I was thinking, you know, the de minimis model has yeah. been advantageous. You 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 know, you avoid duty on high duty goods like apparel and footwear, and then you can air freight it. Some folks are obviously building DCs or maintaining DCs in Mexico and Canada, and then drop shipping into the U.S. from there. But I, I would have to think a lot of a lot of folks on Capitol Hill are very concerned about the de minimis rate of being so high, eight hundred dollars a day per per shipper per per purchaser, if you will. Um, and a lot of folks have called it on Capitol Hill the trade free trade agreement with China because Xi'an and Timu have utilized this model to, to basically prop their companies up. And of all the bipartisan things that are not that don't exist, this is one that does exist, and it is. I would be shocked by the end of the year or start of the next year, we don't see some kind of reduction in de minimis. Um, and then what happens to the freight rates then if, if there's less incentive to move this product under duty so or avoiding duty. So, I, you know, there's a lot happening. And again, these variables are innumerable. I mean, we can talk about this for the next six hours about all the things that are impacting, but it's a 20 minute podcast. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll have to keep it tight. <laughs> Um, so it, it, it sounds like, um, capacity is going to be an issue for the rest of the year. Um, and then on, on the import side, it seems like Mike, you can kind of share this too, but West coast ports seem to be operating normally. Yeah, everything's okay from there, that standpoint. Yeah. The, everything seems to be okay. There is some port congestion here and there, but it's nothing significant. It's uh, it, everything's okay. running pretty smooth. Uh, yeah, and that I, I was I was reading today in the journal, Wall Street Journal, about how um, the dock workers from on the East Coast and the Gulf have um, have contracts coming up soon, and they've right. they're already starting to get chippy. The unions are getting chippy with the uh, the ports, so not sure what's going to happen. With that a lot of that's around um, automation, using more robotics. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Right, that I so, saw that too. Uh, it's very interesting. Something to be concerned about. On, yeah. 
So just like one more thing to add to the list to watch over the summer. The one call out I would have, Andy, is the rail. Anything going into the central part of the U.S., the rail is still a little bit of a a challenge. And mainly because we don't have that that many exports coming out of the U.S. There used to be a lot of agriculture and stuff coming out of the Midwest. And um, that's not really, it's not at the same volumes it used to be. So the rail is a little bit unstable. So if you're going into like Chicago, Indy, Memphis, you know, you could still experience a delay on the rail. So we're starting to see people transload again, which we saw during COVID. So there's another, you know, COVID thing, uh, which, you know, that went away all of last year. And now people are transloading on the West Coast and not using the rail. So. Can you can you share what that means in layman terms? What is transloading? Transloading is when you take the ocean container uh, off the port, you bring it to a warehouse, and then you take all the goods out and you put it into a 53-foot trailer and truck it to, let's say, Chicago or India and not rely on the rail system uh, because the rail could be a 15, 20-day delay at some points. Right now, it's about uh, 12-day delay from the time it hits the port to the time it gets on the rail, uh, depending on locations and various things, but yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because I think there was, there's all the, this continual debate around like where we were a house, right? I think most of it's still West Coast, right around Port Long Beach, Port of LA. Right. But some people did try to move it more to Indianapolis or more into the strategically to a location where they could drop ship quickly anywhere. So it is interesting to see those challenges and those issues crinkle up because if you don't work on supply chains, and obviously <laughs> we spent like a year where everything was a supply chain problem and everybody knew what supply chains were, even our kids. Um, you know, it's just these little wrinkles that start to have a magnified impact uh, step by step, getting a product from where it's made into a consumer's hands. So it's it's interesting. Definitely. Matt? As we kind of wrap it up, you got any kind of last thoughts? As no, we- man, I, I'm PZ. Did not disappoint you. You had all the you had all the answers for all the complicated questions. So Andy and I went to the right spot as usual. Well, I appreciate it, guys. And, and Andy, you're right though. Last year was kind of an easy year for me, man. I just coasted right through 2023, and now all of a sudden I'm dealing with a lot of stuff. So it was this is, this is what we get paid for, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, keep taking your anxiety medication and uh, there's, you know, that's the only thing that's going to get through, I think, right now. But I mean, it is, I mean, people always wonder why you have to stay engaged in Washington. And it's for these very reasons. It's like, well, that didn't impact our industry. But like, no, I, actually, any, any instance of trade policy enactment or redaction impacts every industry. Because you get squeezed in one way or there's an opening in another way. And so I think this is the problem we have as Americans is like we're so simplistic around like policy making. It's like, well, that doesn't really impact me yet. In some way, it will. Um, There's anything around trade impacts capacity. Um, So these 301 tariffs, you know, I saw the the EV tariffs, you know, the Chinese EVs. No one asked for those in the U.S. Tesla didn't even really care um but that again like well it's not footwear but like, doesn't matter it's going to impact capacity it's going to impact shipping strategies it's going to impact you know all these things and so you you have to be engaged and active and, and watching what's happening and and you have to be engaged and active in dc to like share perspective uh, around things as well amen yep definitely all right, Mike. Um, just, I mean, Mike. Just so you know, you don't have to show up to the stock exchange to make your trades. You can do it electronically now. I don't know if you know that, but I just, I wanted to point that out. Thank you, that, thank you. That was, yes. I'm looking um, forward to that event. I always do. So, <laughs> us too. It's nice to be back there. Uh, we have a running, we have a running, um, uh, a running thing where we're always up at the end of the day. So, the S and P. On an FDRA event day is always up. So if you're looking to invest, what's the date, Matt? Is it July? July 16th. There you go. So you want to invest July 15th towards the end of the trading day to get the benefit of the 16th. Can't guarantee the 17th. Now, I'm not saying speculate, but speculate, if you will. <laughs> Shoe speculation. Uh, this this episode of Shoe and Show is, is not a endorsement of investment. In, but, 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 you know, we need a disclaimer at the end just to cover our asses. 
Buy, 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 buy. Sell, 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 sell. All right, folks. Uh, Shoe and Show. Thanks for joining us every Monday. New Shoe and Show. Um, go back to our catalog, shoeandshow.com. Um, this podcast is really, again, trying to dig into things impacting our industry so people can better prepare um, and make better, more strategic decisions. We appreciate um, Mike and Apex Global's continued support. Uh we're over a decade now of working together, Mike. So yeah. we really appreciate the continued support uh, of our events and of our industry, um, uh, of your knowledge sharing and, and your and your friendship that you have of, of trying to help us solve a lot of problems that keep popping up. Um, no one knew how important you were ten years ago, Mike. We did, but now everybody <laughs> knows, right? Like, so. <laughs> All right, folks, as always, thank you for listening. Next Monday, new episode. We appreciate you listening. Um, and again, you can go to fura.org and see all our events. We, we do have a sourcing summit, again, coming up very soon in July. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing many of you there. Um, in the meantime, if there's issues that pop up, give us a ring. Until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit fdra.org.